Kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man, trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random time so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable. Honestly, hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five. Fake France. Towards the end of World War I, Paris was tired of, you know, seeing their city of love get blown to smithereens, as one would. So they figured, you know what? Let's try and fool those Germans, right? Let's try and do some trickery. Let's just build a fake Paris and then shut out all the lights. And it worked. Yeah, they psyched them out. They created a decoy, a very large, 
Decoy. The life-size stunt double was posted up only a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. This tiny town called Mason's Lafayette, now of course it's looking a lot more full than it was when it was, you know, a hollow shell of a fake town, now it's a tourist area. There were once three different zones set up around the real Paris. Zone A was northeast of the city, had fake train stations, mimicked a suburban region of St. Denis, but it had a big fake Gare du Nord train station, right? That was the main pull. Like, hey, come on, we're looking nice and hopeful, come attack us, and it worked. Zone B, northwest of the city, that was Mason's Lafayette, the main fake Paris, right? And zone C was the industrial area, just east of the city. They had massive factories built with, you know, obviously nothing inside of them. This sounds pretty home alone when you think of it, but these missions only happening overnight, creating a light show with some big fancy props isn't a bad idea. It's gonna save a lot of lives and money. Lights were carefully spaced out so it looked like a breathing city from above, and they fell for it for some of the time. They looney tuned the Germans, and it worked. They're like, yeah, it's Paris. Hit that really fast. It's good. Number four, space junk. In 1961, John Glenn would become the first astronaut to successfully orbit in space. He lapped the Earth a couple times with the help of Friendship 7, NASA's command mission pushing ever closer and closer to the moon. While in space, Glenn and fellow crew noticed tiny gold particles that shone like fireflies. Quote, uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, try to describe what I'm seeing up here. Uh, it's a big mass of some very small particles that are brilliantly lit up like uh, they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around a little. They're coming out of the capsule and they just look like stars. A whole shower of them coming over. Over. They had come to the conclusion it was liquid from inside the capsule and the suits leaking out. And that liquid was urine. Not aliens, not fireflies, not disintegrating ship. Frozen pee pee. Yeah, guess drinking all that tang all day. Glenn flew on Discovery in 1998 and became, at age 77, the oldest person to fly in space at the time. Damn Shatner. Number three, Project MDXX. If you've seen Project X, this one's gonna ring a bell or two. About 500 years ago, yep, you missed it, in 1520, for two and a half weeks in June, both England's King Henry VIII and Francis Francis I, two of the greatest monarchs in Renaissance Europe, they both threw a joint birthday party that lasted 18 days, and it only cost about $19 million by today's standards. Nice. I went mini putting for my eighth birthday. That's why I called it Project MDXX. The numerals in the year, yeah, you get it, not bad. Not only was this a chance for them to celebrate their friendship, but it was also a chance for them to try and outdo one another and continue to show off. So for this huge bash, for starters, around 12,000 people showed up and gathered in the fields of the northern tip of what is now France. All tents, costumes, decorations were all gold embellished. Guests were fed 29,000 fish, 98,000 eggs, 6,400 birds, 2,200 sheep, and 216,000 gallons of wine just to wash all that clout down. Mm. On top of that, there were jousts, wrestling matches, elaborate mask parties. I have FOMO just talking about it right now. The two kings both wanted to outdo each other, but there were rules put in place beforehand. These kings could not compete with one another during the celebrations, right? So instead, they tried to outspend each other in a nice way. They're like, oh yes, look at all of my gold. No, look at all my gold. We love blowing all of our resources in two and a half weeks. Nice. Looking good, guys. Keep it up. Number two, Olympic arts. In the early 20th century, the Olympics were getting creative, literally. Hundreds of years of blood, sport, and victorious games, and people were looking for some new events. 1912, Summer Olympics, they decided to add official awarded medals for painting, sculpture, architecture, literature, and music. All right. One rule, though. They had to be of Olympic sport nature. Paintings of people boxing, sculptures of people whipping discs around, and of course, a couple doodles of some dudes playing rugby. Which won Gene Jacoby two gold medals. Of course, these were Olympic grade pieces of art. So you know they were the best of the best. Of course, you could compete in both sport and art. American athlete Walter Winnens took the podium after winning gold in sharpshooting, and also the very first gold in sculpture. Yeah, lovely. He made a little bronze horse pulling a chariot. Isn't that nice? People just taping up their wrists, mouth guards in, and you're just sharpening your pencil. Hey, how are you? About to draw. <laughs> Good luck. And finally, number one, Jurassic Timeline. All right, this one goes out to all the T-Rexes out there. If you're watching, hit that thumbs up with your little hands. Nice big reach hit that subscribe button. When we think of the times of the dinosaurs, we tend to think of all of them roaming the planet at one time, and then a meteor hit, and then they were all toast. But that is certainly not the case. It's a little shocking, but here's our timeline. 
Dinosaur communities were not only spread apart by geography, but also by time and the age of the dinosaurs. For one, it lasted so long that it included three separate geological time periods. It's a long time. Fun fact, there is more time separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from the Stegosaurus than there is separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from humans. Yeah, that's how long ago dinosaurs have been kicking, or not kicking rather, know what I mean? We can't comprehend this time. Like this is so far away, it doesn't even make sense. We think of the ancient Egyptians, we're like, oh, that's, I don't know. Dinosaurs? Stegosaurus, you know those herbivores with the plates on their back and the spiky tails, they always do this and take out your cars, whatever, Jurassic World, I've seen it. They roamed Earth 150 million years ago during the Jurassic period and the age of the dinosaurs. And then the T-Rex first appeared about 80 million years after the Stegosaurus had been extinct. And that was about, you know, 67 million years ago from today. This means that while 80 million years separated those two, there's only 67 million years that separate us from a T-Rex. Crazy fact. Uh, hit that thumbs up. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a knight and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god, no thank you. Number seven, 
being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No, thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, the Gallo Hills. You may have heard of the haunting of the Hill House, but have you ever heard of the Gallo Hills? There were some of the true locations of the Gallo Hills was quite a puzzling question for some time. It wasn't until January 2016 where they found the actual location, where they discovered through rumors listed in records. In 1692, Rebecca Ames and other women were believed to be practicing witchcraft and were removed from their home. As she was forced to turn down Boston Street is where she could see the gallows ahead for Salem Village. Later that day, Ames found herself in a trial and according to the report, she was asked if she witnessed the execution that morning. She said she has been as the house below the hill. The witness those at their hanging. Turns out the house was none other than John McCarter's house. And the location is now behind a Walgreens drugstore today. The trials, according to the mayor Discroll, told CBS Boston News that it was definitely a dark part of their history. A time where the people of Salem had turned on one another and hopes that the lesson since then has transcended to overcome what happened in 1692. Number four, the doctor's ledge. From the Gala Hills to the doctor's ledge. It's very difficult for historians to pinpoint exactly where the executions typically took place. Although the concept of burning at the stake is what most trials seem to consist of, but it was more of a European method to cure witchcraft. But in the cases of the Doctor's Ledge, this was a site where a lot of the unceremonious dumping grounds of many witches' bodies were tossed to. That's right, as if it couldn't get any worse and less humane. Once those prosecutions were executed, their bodies would be then thrown into a crevice near the gallows instead of properly buried. Many tourists or attendees would feel melancholy and feel chills down their spines with the many ghost tours located in Salem. It's abundantly clear with the many lives lost, it's no doubt this city might actually be haunted. Number three, the witch house. We mentioned that horrible sheriff George Corwin and his nepotism earlier on the list. Well, guess who he's related to? None other than Judge Jonathan Corwin, a judge who served on the court which sentenced 19 people to death by hanging for witchcraft. Still standing after 400 years, many people believe because of Corwin's involvement with the witch trials, then the location of the home is a frequent number of spirits of those he had sentenced to death. Other visitors have noted Corwin himself roaming the halls and in addition, his descendants who passed early in life. Number two, the winter of 1692. Now for the top two, we'll divide this back towards the beginning, the start of it all the Salem Witch Trials. When the accusation of witchcraft began in Salem, witch hunting in Europe within the 14th and the 17th century seemed to occur around the same time. And it was roughly estimated tens of thousands of European witches, mostly women, were executed. One winter in 1692 in Salem, three girls allegedly claimed of having strange visions. And when they were being treated by the local village doctor, his diagnosis? 
witchcraft. However, despite the conclusions through modern discussion, it was theorized that these girls were either suffering from mental health issues, epilepsy, or even a disease brought by eating expired rye bread infected by fungus. Not like the ones from the video game The Last of Us, but the kind that can accumulate a psychoactive alkaloid like LSD. So in conclusion, these girls were either dealing with untreated health issues, tripping on moldy bread, or they were just really, really bored that night. Whatever the cause was, it was enough to spark the flames on the wooden stakes that so many innocent lives would befall into. Number one, Sarah Good, Tichuba, and Sarah Osborne. Once the three girls claimed they saw the unexplainable visions, they accused three specific women for the cause of their hallucinations. Sarah Good, Tichuba, and Sarah Osborne. These three women were considered social outcasts at the time, as they all lived in a Puritan society heavily conformed with rules. Sarah Good was once the daughter of a well-to-do tavern owner who died when she was 16. With no will or proof of ownership of his land, Sarah Good was left with no dowry or any prospects for marriage. And when she did marry, she was left with even more debt from her deceased husband, Daniel Poole. Sarah Good was forced to resort to begging, alongside with her new husband, William Good, and their daughter, Dorothy Good, who at four years old was accused of witchcraft. And you can guess who accused her. It was mentioned back at number seven. Although her true origins are unknown due to lack of documentations of enslaved individuals, Tichuba was considered to be either an enslaved native or African woman. She lived in Salem and worked under the Reverend Samuel Paris. Although she did survive the witch trials by confessing, she still suffered under poor conditions living in the Boston Gowl. Revealing in an interview in 1693, Tichiba confirmed that Samuel Paris had beaten a confession out of her and coached her on what to say during the trials. Which leads us to Sarah Osborne. See, during the witch trials, Sarah Good and Tichiba had both accused Osborne of being a witch. Sarah Osborne was the most well-off out of the three, as her first marriage was to a wealthy man named Robert Prince, and Robert was close to his brother-in-law, Captain John Putnam, part of the noble Putnam family and a true Puritan. Hostilities between Sarah Osborne and the captain grew after she claimed Robert's estates was hers when he had died. In societal norms, this was not okay since Robert had bestowed his entire estate to his brother-in-laws, the, P the Putnams. Because of depression, long illness, and the legal tensions with the Putnam family, Sarah Osborne could not attend to church or town hall meetings for almost three years, which gave the Putnams, Reverend Samuel Paris, and those probably jealous of Sarah Osborne, all the more reasons to accuse her of witchcraft. Now, when you think of scary stories or horror stories, there's always this cognitive understanding that it has to do with something with the supernatural or beyond ourselves of comprehension, like demons or ghosts. But in truth, the real horror is ourselves, people. To these very real human beings, they generally felt justified that what they were doing at the time was morally correct, but in the cases regarding the Salem witch trials, it really wasn't. With its rich histories, Salem still remains one of the most attractive tourist location spots, especially on Halloween. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other, all because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? 
shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird. Go home. Relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was going to happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches. Just saying. Number five, Sir Adrian Cotton DeWalt. Love that name. There are gonna be a couple unbelievable events on this list from World War II, so just a heads up. But truth be told, the war itself is kind of hard to believe. Sir Adrian Cotton de Wart was not only a man who survived the impossible once, but he made a career out of it. He wasn't like your black adder general in the back with a pipe. This dude was on the front lines tossing grenades with one arm because he already lost the other. He served in the Boer War, World War I, and World War II. He survived being shot in the face, skull, hip, leg, ankle, and ear. One eye and one arm short, this enthusiastic war hero dove into the bloodshed again and again. He was seen pulling pins out of grenades and throwing them with his one good arm during Battle of the Somme. But even as a six-year-old man, he was still a beast. His plane got shot down in April 1941. He crashed it into the Mediterranean, survived, swam all the way to shore. Then he got captured by Italian soldiers, thrown into a POW camp. Then he escaped, eluded capture for eight days. But unfortunately, the lack of Italian looks gave him away. He was released two years later, and Churchill was such a big fan of him, he made him his rep over in China. He ended up passing away peacefully at age 83 despite hundreds of close calls with death. Number four, Simo Heha. This is actually kind of a plug for a short film I'm looking to raise funds for. Check out my Instagram to learn more. But his story is incredible and it's so unbelievable. Simo Heha's story sounds like something straight out of a movie, except it actually happened. A humble Finnish farmer who became the Soviet's nightmare in World War II. He is widely regarded as one of the most accomplished and skilled snipers in history. The Winter War began in Finland in 1939 after Russia decided that it was time to regain some territory. They thought it was going to be easy. But soon they came to fear the man who would be known as the White Death. 
He was trained as a sniper at a young age, didn't want to take human lives though, so he just became a farmer, but the lives of his countrymen were at stake. The winter war lasted just over 100 days and within that time, Simo hit as many as 500 men, his personal best being 40 confirmed hits in one day. Some people estimate that it was over 800 people. In March 1940, he was hit in the jaw by a counter sniper, leaving him in a coma for 11 days. But when he awoke, however, the Russians surrendered. That is poetic justice. Number three, Alexander the Great. How did this guy exist? Was he the son of Zeus? The case is so convincing that even Alexander believed it himself. During the 15 years of his conquest, starting from his first victory when he was 18, Alexander never lost a battle. He was so prolific in battle that his strategies are still studied to this day. Before Alexander entered Egypt, they had been under Persian rule for just over 200 years. Through his incredible prowess and lightning quick decision making, Alexander defeated them. Egypt was so happy they even claimed him as their pharaoh. While he was in Egypt, however, Alexander decided to make the long trek to visit the shrine of Zeus Ammon. According to the man himself, he was guided there by ravens and it even rained during his journey which was interpreted as a blessing. When he got there, the priest named him a son of Zeus. Now if that doesn't make this guy sound like a myth, then I I don't know what will. Number two, Bodicea. Bodicea is the Morrigan in my mind. She is Xena, warrior princess. This woman was so ferocious, she was called the scourge of the Roman Empire. Yeah, that's right, this queen took on the Roman Empire. At the time Rome was invading the south of Britain, Queen Bodicea ruled the Inseni tribe of East Anglia along her husband, King Prasutagus. Though her early days remain mostly a mystery, she remains among the canon of heroes who defended the British Isles. She was fearsome to behold, with flaming red hair and a gaze so sharp it could cut glass. She and her husband fought against the Romans until his death, after which the Romans drove straight to take her on. They attacked her daughters publicly, which like mother bear, not a good idea, after which she tore in a chariot rallying the people in rebellion. She sat three Roman cities and took no prisoners. She annihilated the 9th legion when she took out their entire relief force. Sadly though, Bodicea fell after a vicious battle, but her name echoes in the halls of heroes. And last but not least, Richard, Saladin, and the Third Crusade. Just the Crusades in general are just unbelievable. Never in history have two rulers been so equally matched. Currently I'm reading Warriors of God, Richard the Lionheart, and Saladin and the Third Crusade by James Rustin. And the fact that everything I've read so far like, isn't just the next Game of Thrones novel astounds me. These two never met because Saladin believed that kings should not go to war if they had met, but because they were fighting over the Holy Land, war was kind of inevitable. But while Saladin did not engage in warfare, Richard dove right in the middle of everything. They both had such incredible admiration for each other that in the middle of battles, they would send each other gifts. Like, I don't understand. You killed my men. You killed my men. Here's a fruit basket literally happened, and another example, during the Battle of Jaffa, Richard's horse ended up being killed and Saladin was so impressed with him that he sent him two new ones. Two! On top of that, Richard had taken off half of his armor before he had left ashore to fight. So he was like, basically like, half naked. Huh. Eventually Saladin tried to have him assassinated, but Richard was so ferocious in battle that everyone feared him. The dude was pretty much a human bulldozer. The two assassins ended up waking up the camp because they were fighting about who should take the guy out. Number 10, Abe the Wrestler. At 20 years old with a record of 300 fights and one loss, he stands 6'4 inches at 185 pounds. Your future president of the United States, honest the chair! Give him the chair! That's right, Abe Lincoln was quite the ruffian. However, the wrestling back then wasn't as organized as there was no WWF per se. It was mostly just a show of strength and skill, but there were competitions among men. Huge crowds gathered, towns watched, everybody gambled. It was great. A little wrestling. His fights earned him respect while campaigning too. He would even scrap hecklers at debates. Yeah, just walks down midpoint and Wheeler whips someone under their neck. His chirps were amazing too. He would just look at people like Gladiator and call them out. He'd be like, hey, I'm the big buck of this lick. If any of you want to try it, come on and get your wet horns. Yeah, I didn't think so. Sorry, Mr. Douglas, proceed. Thank you. Number nine, Roy Sullivan. They say lightning never strikes the same place twice, but if you knew Roy Sullivan, you knew that's not entirely true. Yeah, meet the man who was struck by lightning 
seven times and lived to tell the tale. Roy Sullivan was born in 1912. He sadly passed away in 1983 when he was 71 years old, but God tried, God tried a few times to get him out earlier, it seems. He was born in Greene County, Virginia. Roy was a park ranger in Shenandoah National Park in 1936. He was nicknamed the Human Lightning Conductor, and he appeared in the Guinness Book of World Records. Roy's first encounter with, you know, the might of Thor, was when he was just 30 years old at the Fire Lookout Tower. He said that lightning strike, again, out of the seven he survived, was the most painful out of all of them. The lightning bolt burned a strip all the way down his leg, even blowing a hole through his shoe, yet somehow he survived. Roy was also hit by lightning in 1969 while driving a truck, and also in 1970 while gardening on an otherwise clear day like today, also in 1972 while inside a guardhouse, also in 1976 during another storm, and finally in 1977 while fishing. Yeah, Roy passed away in 1983, and to this day, two of his ranger hats are on display at the Guinness World exhibits in New York City and South Carolina. This man cheated death eight times. Seven. Number eight, Miss Unsinkable. Violet Constant Jessup, AKA the queen of sinking ships, or Miss Unsinkable, was an Argentine Irish woman who worked as an ocean liner stewardess, memoirist, and Red Cross nurse in the early 20th century. Jessup is well known for having survived three sinkings of major ships the RMS Olympic in 1911, the RMS Titanic in 1912, and her sister, the HMHS Britannic in 1916. Yeah, talk about the luckiest person ever. Lady's got some angels watching over her, I swear. The first ship, they turned around and made it back just in time. The Titanic, well, watch the movie, you'll understand. And then the third ship, it must have just felt personal by that point. Really? Not to mention barely surviving tuberculosis as a child. This woman is truly a saint. Returning to work after all those accidents, dedicating her entire life to the Red Cross, trying to save others, Sadly, she passed away at 83. Number seven, lost at sea. The Robertson family, they're quite a historical one. Strap in, folks. Back in 1971, Dougal, Lynn, and their four children, and Douglas, Neil, and Sandy, all set sail on what was planned to be a trip around the world. It sounds magnificent. Our family saw a movie once. Aboard their 13-meter boat, the Lucette, they traveled through the Caribbean and then across the Panama Canal to the Pacific, right? That was their trail. A year and a half went by, they were on route through the Galapagos, and one of the daughters, Anne, who was 18, decided to leave the voyage. Yeah, she's like, ah, you know what? I'm actually not on board for this anymore. I'm really seasick, bye. And then in Panama, they took on a hitchhiker named Robin Williams. Great name. This hitchhiker was in for more of an adventure than they thought, because after this point, their lives were never the same again. West of the Galapagos Islands, a pod of killer whales struck the boat. Wood then began to crack, and the boat subsequently started to sink. They all moved to the inflatable life raft, but after 16 days of using their own breath to keep inflating it over and over 24-7, the six of them were sadly forced to relocate into an even smaller dinghy. Then they somehow survived for 38 days at sea, while sailing towards the center of the Pacific with no goal in mind other than to survive. All they had to drink was some water left over from the Lucette, with sea turtles being their only diet. Yeah, save the turtles, unless of course you're stranded at sea. Then in that case, sorry to 52 of you. Finally, after 38 days, they were spotted by a passing Japanese fishing boat, and then thankfully, they were rescued. Number six, Mad Jack Churchill. No, not that Churchill, but equally as British, and even bolder. Mad Jack Churchill, AKA, John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill was a British Army officer who fought in the Second World War with a longbow, bagpipes, and a Scottish broadsword. Dude, this guy lived a life. Was in like every war. Trained people how to fight and how to parachute. This guy was fighting machine guns with a bow and a sword. And was at like the front of the lines, leading them. Taunting people, playing the bagpipes. You know how intimidating that is? How is there not like 15 movies about this guy? Not only did he thrive in the rough stuff, guy revolutionized surfing. He was also pissed the Americans dropped some nukes. He wanted to keep fighting, you know? Like imagine that pep talk. All right, lads, I'm gonna play a wee jingle here first and then I'm gonna go out, take this sword, and I'm gonna start swinging. All right, good luck. Number five. Nothing is true, everything is permitted. The Medici family didn't exactly live around the medieval times, but fairly close. 
That being said, The Family is something similar to the Kardashians of today. No, not a hit reality show based around wealthy women who sit around their mansion all day looking for a good verbal argument. No, but rather a well-known family who had extreme wealth and as time went on gained a lot more wealth and power. The Medici got their wealth by being successful bankers. And when you got money, you got power. And they owned a lot of property and had clients in multiple cities. Some family members would later become royalty like Catherine de' Medici, and even more powerful by some family members becoming next to the Lord himself as the Pope. Which if you're into that sort of thing, you would know how serious that position really is. What I'm getting at is, you don't get that powerful without breaking a few eggs. They used money and power to manipulate and they got their way. Number 4. Diaper Sniper All right. This one's messed up, but that's just how things were. Marriage is a beautiful matrimony between two loving people that has a harmonious, lasting lifetime. Tell that to people in divorce court and see where that gets you. While we may marry for love today, things were a little bit different back in the oldie times. Marriage was oftentimes a business opportunity or a peace treaty of sorts, and other versions of marriage would have you on a certain dateline show with Chris Hansen. I'm talking about girls getting married at the old refined age of 12. Yuck. It's just how it was. At the time, that was considered the age of maturity, but I mean, if you only live until you're 35, it kind of makes sense, I guess. While most of these cases are from poor people, at the end of the day, they were women and simply could not own business and property that men could. So it's in the best interest that a wealthy man marries a poor girl. Gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Number three, dyslexia for cure found. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes reading can be really hard. You've seen my blooper reel. I mean, I went to school, I got my grade 10, and that's really cool. Maybe soon I'll be able to go to college and get my PFD. But I wasn't a big fan of school. I just like to hang out with my friends. But then again, I did have the opportunity to attend school. The same cannot be said for poor peasants in the medieval age. Some wealthy kings would go as far as to ban the serfs from learning to read. Wouldn't want your population to be too smart. They might overthrow you after all. And sorry, ladies. Ladies, that means you aren't going either. Schools were boys clubs, no girls allowed. The richest of families could have their son sent off to be a squire and eventually enter knightship for their royal throne. But this was for the very rich. I can't help but think that I would look good in all that metal armor though. Give me a sword, a shield, noble steed. I'm assuming the wealthy would let me go to school. Please sir, could I learn to read? Number 2. Do you require a bowel movement sir? Kings will be kings, and sometimes they do some things that shouldn't be things. Meet the royal groom of the stool, a man who must follow the king around with a ye olde porta potty, or really just a bowl, where he would be ready to assist the royal in a release of his bowels. Originally created by King Henry VIII, the groom's job was to assist the king with a box to relieve himself, also carrying towels and water, even monitoring the outcome of such daily events. After all, he's the king, gotta keep tabs on his diet. It's also rumored that the kings may have even required assistance in hygiene after the fact. Which I mean, come on, I know we all need help sometimes, but that's a tad much. With all the disease and not hand washing at the time, I'm not really sure anyone ate food ever again. Ooh. Number 1. Dead End Job Wiping a royal bum is tough, but cleaving a man's head from his body kinda sucks too. The rich uphold the law and that means when it's time for the death penalty, somebody's gotta do it. Somebody with less money and somebody who might not have a choice as professional unalivers at the time often were handed down the blood soaked acts of their kin. On one hand, you have law and order that is respected. On the other hand, you have a profession that sees law and order through, but is not that well respected. Makes sense that the job kinda sucks though. Unalivers often had to practice their skills and eventually worked their way up to the real McCoy. Practicing on pumpkins, animals, and eventually criminals. If they got it wrong, i.e. too many swings of the axe, people would rush and attack their unaliver. Despite what movies and cartoons may make you think, these people did have empathy for what they were doing, and because of their social status, a lot of them lived lonely lives. Number 10. Dead Horse Beach this is going to be one of the lightest topics on our list, so let's start off with a poorly said joke. What do you call a horse that lives next door? A neighbor. Get it? I don't know where I was going with this. I'm sorry. Anyways, in the 1850s, the people in Salem would bury their dead horses on a beach, located at Willow Park. Originally just named Horse Beach, the location in itself was pretty far from town, so once they started burying their dead horses on said beach, they decided to then just change the name to just Dead Horse Beach, you know, just in case anyone forgot or needed to know where to bury their horses. Not to be confused with Dead Horse Bay, which is located in New York. That one is because at around the same year, there were dead horses around and horse rendering farms were in the area, a farm where they broke down byproducts of dead horses. The 1850s was a wild time. Not a good time for the horses. After all, it must have been a nightmare. <laughs> 
sorry. Okay, well, today it's very popular with beachgoers, and with the shattered shells, remains of blue mussels give the sand an unusual texture of blue and white colors. Number nine, Joshua Ward House. Joshua Ward House is one of the many haunted houses I will mention on this list. At the age of 25, George Corwin was the high sheriff during the witch trials in 1692. Most likely getting the position from nepotism, there was a sense of pride George had as he carried out his duties on the prosecutions laid before him, one of which was a gruesome death of Giles Corey, a 73-year-old man condemned for refusing to comply with court procedures. Corwin would have Corey lie on his back as he was forced to have weights planked across his body. Layering and layering, the weight was so unbearable that Corey Corey's tongue would eventually roll out of his mouth as Corin would use his walking stick to poke the tongue back in. Ultimately, Corey died from the pressure once the weights eventually crushed his chest and breaking his ribs. There are numerous rumors that George Corin included the idea of torturing prisoners in his basement and how he or his victims haunt the site to this day. Although there's no evidence to claim this to be true, the popular tradition maintains that Josh Ward House is still haunted to this day. Number eight, Garner Pingree House. In 1830, Captain Joseph White was an 82-year-old widower who lived with his beloved niece, Mary Beckford, at the Garner Pingree House. Mary wanted to marry a man named Joseph Jenkins Knapp Jr., a former shipmaster of a sailing vessel White owned. Captain White did not feel that Knapp's intentions were pure and that he knew Knapp's only desire was subjugated for her fortune. Still, she married him anyway, and the captain disowned her. Knapp felt that if the captain died, the inheritance would surely be his. I mean, hers. But despite the captain being 82 years old, there was no patience for a natural death. So one night, Captain White decided to sleep a little later than usual. And when the distant relative Benjamin White woke up the next morning, he discovered the back window was open. Worried burglars had entered the home, he awoke in the housekeeper, only to find the Captain White laying on the floor lifeless in his room. He had suffered from blunt trauma and had died from his injuries, especially from the five punctured ones near his heart. It was later discovered that Joseph Knapp and his brother John hired a hitman to murder the captain. The case shook the nation and eventually inspired a very popular and well-known writer. He wrote a story of a man who relished the excitement of murdering an old man in a legendary short called The Tell Tell Heart. That author was Edgar Allan Poe. The case was also inspired another famous writer who's a native to Salem, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who's related to, actually wait, let me tell you later. Number seven, The Haunting Burying Point Cemetery. When I mention Nathaniel Hawthorne, this amazing writer who wrote a lot of dark romanticism, he's also the author who wrote The Scarlet Letter, The House of the Seven Gables, and so, so many more. He's also the great-grandson of John Hathorne, who is buried at the Bering Point Cemetery. And if you're a little rough with your history, John Hathorne was one of the notorious leading judges that sentenced so many lives lost during the infamous witch trials. And despite his notoriety of being a judge, the truth is he was never legally trained as a trusted law official, but like many other judges at the time, were just wealthy merchants. He owned a wharf and a liquor license, a landowner with property. He had no certification to make actual legal justifications and always presumed guilt. He took in a lead in questioning, backed accusers, and believed in the minimal evidence and tests used to see if one was a witch. At one point, he even accused a four-year-old for witchcraft. Hathorne died at the age of 76, never apologizing for his role during the Salem witch trials. And with many high profile or decision makers of the trials also laid to rest here, the Burying Point Cemetery are left haunted memories of the unjust decisions utilized against the innocent. Visitors have claimed seeing shadowy figures and eerie occurrence, especially around Hawthorne's grave. As for Nathaniel Hawthorne, the descendant of the judge, has completely disowned his distant relative, which is why he adjusted his name to Hawthorne with a W, as a way to push away his relation from the judge, which could say is also a win. Number six, the Ropes Mansion. There's a lot of haunted houses in Salem, and the best part is if you ever get a chance to visit the city, they do offer tours around the town, including the Ropes Mansion. Now, the Ropes Mansion is a very familiar to Disney fans, especially the Hocus Pocus fans. This is the same location where they shot the film, but this location is also notorious for the ghosts that haunt it. The building was made by Samuel Bernard in the 1720s, but was little known about the man who built it. He led a prosperous life in Salem and remarried multiple times. But the building itself seems to be also cursed with so many inconvenience occurrences from smallpox epidemics that ravenously took over the Salem village, a fire that struck the mansion from 1891 and another one as recently as 2009. Those who have perished in the fire seems to be heard lingering as spirits screaming, as well as many other spirits who have once walked those halls. Number five, the smooth hand fish. Not to be confused with cool hand Luke. The smooth hand fish was the first time in modern history where a marine type fish has gone extinct. This fish was a shallow water bottom dweller and I personally love him because he looks like one of the Bowser's minions. He looks moody. He has a fin that protrudes out of his face. Out of his face. Just 200 years ago, you would have seen these smooth dudes in the land down under. It lived in Australia, in Tasmania's warm waters and what made this fish so unique as its name hints towards is its hands. The smooth hand fish would seemingly walk along the ocean floor using its fins as hands. 
The smooth hand fish would seemingly walk along the ocean floor using its fins as hands. So an angry looking fish with hands and a horn would walk towards you? Hard pass. Graham Edgar, marine ecologist at the University of Tasmania, shed some light on its habits, explaining that these fish were homebodies. They didn't have a large habitat. Oh, they just had like all the hands for the house. They spent most of their time sitting in the seabed with an occasional flap for a few meters if they're disturbed. At that point, they would just walk with their hands away from the drama. That's how I want to walk away from drama from now on. Like somebody brings it up to me and I'm just like. <laughs> Number four, Permian Triassic, AKA the Great Dying. Okay, what a nickname, love it. And one of the most mysterious extinction events on this list, let's talk about it. The Permian Triassic extinction event destroyed the vast majority of life on Earth over 250 million years ago. Life was booming and then silence. Scientists have been boggled and bamboozled for years, but these pieces may finally be coming together. This event is not to be confused with the death of the dinosaurs. That's a different thing, which is still not as sad as the film The Land Before Time. No, this was an event so great that trees, plants, lizards, proto-mammals, insects, fish, mollusks, again, always mollusks, and then microbes didn't see coming. No one saw this coming at all. Nine out of 10 marine species, seven out of 10 land species just entirely vanished. Scientists discovered this event by evaluating fossils and sedimentary rock. While all the previous layers were teeming with life, there was a brief period where it all vanished, like a hamburger without toppings or tartar sauce. Gone in 60 seconds. Just a smooth burger, nothing's getting in the way of that. No tartar sauce dripping down your shirt. Absolutely, that's how fast it went. There are two explanations in the running. One was that it was due to a massive volcanic event, and two, of course, an asteroid. But so far, there have been no traces of either. One hint is the massive anomaly in Wilkes Land, Antarctica. NASA spotted gravitational changes, which indicate an object of immense size sitting in a 300 mile wide crater. A massive object over 151 miles across and dives about 2,700 feet deep beneath the ice could be the massive rock that reset the world 250 million years ago. Or, I know what you're thinking, could also be aliens. We're 50-50 here, we're trying to figure it out. Number three, passenger pigeons. Commonly confused with the morning dove, the passenger pigeon once ruled the skies over Canada as recently as the 19th century. They're quite similar to the pigeons we see today, only instead of being aggressive and covered in mustard, they were quite graceful. Billions of these orange, orange, orange beauties painted the skies and rumor has it they would fly in flocks so large it would block the sun out for a couple hours. Flocks that block. But only a few decades passed and the passenger pigeons are no more. What happened? The very last passenger pigeon was Martha. Oh, Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914, so we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to their extinction. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated arguably the coolest looking bird out there. Number two, the sixth extinction. Remember the book Rachel told me to mention? Well, here it is again, it's that good. Here's a big question no one is ready for. Are we part of the sixth extinction? Is it happening right now? In the past, asteroids and ice ages have all caused massive extinction events, but after human beings invented the wheel and discovered fire, things started to change. In the 1800s, industrialization drove up extinction rates and continues to do so. Based on this list alone, we know how much human beings have played a role in extinction events of the past. Have we created one that we can't stop? According to Elizabeth Kohlberg, across the world, scientists are monitoring what could be the largest extinction event since the dinosaurs. That's right, the way human beings interact with the environment and affect biodiversity could be more deadly than an asteroid hitting the Earth. Come on, we gotta wake up. With an ever climbing list of endangered species, Kohlberg and the world asks this question. Could this be mankind's lasting legacy, and is it too late to change it? And next up we have the Dunkleosis. Now it may sound silly because it has the word dunk in it, <laughs> but this ancient fish did not shoot threes. It actually shot its head at you into self-defense at 50 milliseconds a jab. The Dunkleosis was a 34 foot long armored fish that came from the Devonian era. Its fossil was first discovered in 1867 by Dr. David Dunkel. He of course named it after himself in Dunkel fashion. It swam confidently in subtropical waters and weighing around one ton, which is 2,000 pounds, the dunk was kind of a bully, but it's not his fault. He was
was born this way. Its massive skull was well equipped with two fangs and these razor sharp teeth would rub against each other as they grew. So if the dunk's big rock head wasn't intimidating enough, he's also sharpening his mouth 24 seven. As for diet, the dunk would use those fangs on anything that crossed its path during their coral commute. They would eat fish, sharks, and dare I say, other Dunk Leo style. Cannibal fang fish for the win. Luckily, these guys aren't around anymore. They all went extinct around 360 million years ago during the Devonian extinction. For a scary look fish, it has a rather sweet name. Shout out to David Dunkel. Thanks for all your hard work. Starting off with some geography, we got Lake Nios. How can a lake kill 1,700 people? Well, though it sounds too insane to be true, it did indeed happen. Located in West Africa, the lake itself is deceptively beautiful. However, on August 21st, 1986, a mysterious cloud burst from the lake. It flooded towards the village and suffocated 1,700 people and animals. Nothing survived the event. The reason this happened is because beneath the water, there's a pocket of magma that leaks carbon dioxide into the lake. The CO2 stays dissolved in the water due to the pressure of the 600 50 feet of water on top of the magma secretions. Crazy, so kind of like a pop bottle with an invisible lid. Until one day, that lid popped. On that day, the lake abruptly depressurized and the CO2 exploded into the air, causing the devastating event. Today, pipes are used to siphon the CO2 out from the bottom of the lake in order to prevent this from happening again. But imagine when it did happen, it must have felt like some kind of magical grim occurrence. For, for sure. Number nine, the Salem Witch Trials. If you follow me on MA, you just know how much I hate the Salem Witch Trials. I hate them so much, okay? It's an event in history that is so inconceivably stupid, it's hard to believe it actually happened. The Salem Witch Trials occurred in Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693, where more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft and 20 were put to death. It all started because the daughter of Reverend Paris, Elizabeth, who was nine, and his niece, Abigail Williams, same age, started having fits. Another girl, Anne Putnam, age 11, started having them as well. The supernatural was blamed and soon the girls began accusing everyone they could, mostly people the town didn't like. Basically, if you confessed and you wanted to be saved, then you weren't executed, but if you were accused and didn't confess, you were killed. The paranoia was so bad that once you were accused, you couldn't escape this guilt they put on you. It was insane. But after the paranoia finally subsided, the colony admitted that they probably made a mistake and compensated the families. Like, yeah, oops. Might have gotten a little carried away there. Wow, Whew. I got excited, sorry guys. Here's some money. The Salem Witch Trials today represent what happens when paranoia rules a courtroom and the whole thing still beguiles the world even 300 years later. Number eight, Unsinkable Sam on a happier note. This is the kind of story that makes people believe that cats have nine lives. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tale begins aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Among the 2200 soldiers was a black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard. One day, the Bismarck was decimated during an attack, and while the HMS Cossack was looking for survivors, they saw Oscar the Cat, name of the time, seeking refuge on a plank, like Jack from the Titanic. They hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Cossack would be decimated. That's shipwreck number two. This time, it was the HMS Arc Royale who spotted him, and was then dubbed the name Unsinkable Sam. And then, shipwreck number three. Months later, as you can guess, the Royale was torpedoed. And once again, Sam was saved by the HMS Legion of the British Royal Fleet. Finally, this seafaring feline retired to land and later died in 1955. Number seven, Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly is a woman right out of a Jules Verne novel. In fact, you would think so if she hadn't met the man himself. In 1889, Nellie Bly took on a record-breaking voyage by traveling around the world in just 72 days. Her means of travel included a train, a steamship, a rickshaw, horse, and donkey. Her goal was to beat the fictional record set by Verne's hero, Phileas Fogg, in his 80-day odyssey. An event like this already appeared as a myth to the men of the time. Her editor at the New York World nearly refused to send her because her gender would make the trip impossible. 
possible. No one but a man could do this, he told her. Very well, she replied. Start the man and I'll start the same day for some other newspaper and beat him. He backed down and eventually Nellie was on her way, turning fiction into reality. Number 6, The Black Museum. No, I'm not talking about the Black Museum episode of Black Mirror, but honestly, not too far off. People have done some pretty vicious things to their enemies. There's a long list, but imagine turning your enemies into a permanent dinner guest. Because that's exactly what Ferdinand I of Naples actually did. Though everyone thought he was going to be a great king, he actually ended up being pretty psychotic. He would invite his enemies over for dinner, and while they gorged on pheasant, he would take them out, either the old fashioned way, or literally throw them out of a window. He would then retrieve and dress the bodies and stage them. He called it his black museum and would invite new acquaintances to view it so they would know exactly who they were dealing with. So not to mess with him. What a psycho! Number 5, Agnes Sampson. And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced, because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, Plague Bear. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the dark ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? We can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bearer is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s. But when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? Because anything we learned in the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. Just a little bit, including misinformation. Ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages. Yeah, that title alone gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped the tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three-in-one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go. Keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale. There you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back, so. <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you would leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers. Sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort, I can't believe this was a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare they, how dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this shit. There was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, shame for 46 minutes and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, did they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest 
At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing, as so many people did apparently back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals, they wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French coven, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing, like, in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please, stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. For most of these cases, most likely not witchcraft. This one here with the meowing nuns, I don't know. I think that was actually, something was afoot. That was actually a curse. Either that or it's the greatest prank in history. Either way, we have to finish on a nice happier note, dare I say. Kicking off the list at number 10, leave. One of the first things you'd want to do if you magically were able to travel back to the Middle Ages is come right back. Yeah, it's not knights in shining armor and drinking unlimited IPAs and a heated cot. It was the Dark Ages. It sucked. More often than not, if you lived through the Middle Ages, you never left your village. Because where would you go? The world is also dark and dangerous. Nothing's built yet. You can't warm up in a coffee shop until your Uber arrives, right? Most travelers just slept outside or under some bushes. Records from that time show that the average person didn't travel in their entire life. The rest of this list should also explain why. Number nine, forget a watch. It's pretty easy to find out what time it is today. You can check your smartphone, you can check your watch, you can check your smart watch. We have everything. We don't even have to adjust the hours anymore during daylight saving. That's how easy it is now. You don't even notice anymore. You're like, why is it all of a sudden? Oh, got it. Apple, so good. Back in the Middle Ages, obviously it was harder to check the time. Minutes didn't even exist yet. Yeah, that was that tripped me out when I was reading this. The day was divided by seven long hours. They used water clocks, sundials, all that jazz, but none of them could really tell time to the minute. That long ago, the idea of a minute wasn't a thing. Christian monks were on a tight schedule for work and prayer, so they were actually the first recorded timekeepers in medieval Europe. Imagine being referred to as the <laughs> recorded timekeeper. What time is it? I'm like, Eight. They're like, yo, he's good. Let's get the out of here. This guy's so good. Even so, the length of those hours depends on what time of year it is. Winter and summer months matter. As a Canadian, let me tell you, these dark, cold winters really do suck. It gets dark at like 4 p.m. now. Finish work. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to bed. I don't know. Number eight, forget a mask. The plague made a mark on humanity in the Middle Ages. Back then, they didn't wear a mask and social distance. When Europeans were hit with the Black Death in 1348, fleas carried by rats were mostly to blame. Around one third of the population was killed and it was easily contracted. One sneeze later and your lungs are filling up with liquid. Life expectancy in the late 14th century was 20 years old because of this thing. There was little to no knowledge about germs or how they were spreading, so you'd be in the middle of a literal plague. There'd be bodies lying everywhere, people are dumping, they're doo doo at windows. They're like, oh, good evening, madam. And then you'd inhale and then. Number seven, get married. Love is in the air. In the dark ages, marriage was difficult to do. This was long before divorce lawyers came around to get every last drop of you. It was so easy that if you loved somebody, you would just announce that now you're married. Chris, we're married now. Isn't that crazy? That's how easy it was, boom. No need for a priest, big celebration, paperwork? Who has time for that? Nobody likes that. Sex before marriage, of course, was also a no-no. So if somebody just happened to wander into the wrong chamber and caught you doing the dirty, all you'd have to do is lie on the spot and say that you're married and then be like, get out, weirdo. And they're like, ah, crap, they're married. We'll try again later. But more often than not, witnesses would be asked to be present when this marriage happened because the sad reality is that guys would often go through all this, get in bed, do the <laughs> and then deny ever agreeing to the union in the next town when he's shacking up with somebody else. Horrible. Number six, disturb the peace. When the Toronto Raptors won the NBA championships here, the place looked like Gotham City. Buses were flipped, there was garbage everywhere, people went nuts. Well, it's a good thing basketball wasn't around back in the Middle Ages because if you disturbed the peace in your local town, maybe you got too drunk, maybe you had an argument and got too loud, maybe there was even a scuffle in an alley, an old ha <laughs> ha, one, two. These situations that are common today usually end up with a slap on the wrist. They'll just send you in an Uber home or put you in the drunk tank. But do any of those things in the Middle Ages and you were locked up in the center of the town for an entire day. You'd be locked to the pillory while the town threw stuff at you and said horrible things. They would assault you verbally all day long in the sun. And depending how bad you were the night before and which town you upset, your punishment could be 30 minutes, it could be short and sweet, or it could be all day long and brutal. 
Both of these sound awful with a hangover happening at the same time. Hit that thumbs up and keep the peace. Huh? Number five, keel hauling. Not to be confused with Kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles. Then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them the little feet walking around in their skin and this is when the person and still in the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure historically it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside from there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin, and then that, they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head, it's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee, and I hope you are too. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the Southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and 
I'm immediately back inside. That's it. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name. My lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references, maybe? I don't know. It's kind of horrible. In the Middle Ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now, historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here, and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean, obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames. Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames were a little bit different. They were descriptions, almost, about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense. Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old. Got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice. Here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others joined in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats. I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats 
just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. But rather, the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him. So he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, <sighs> fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh. Many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey, so if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kinda left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. And this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners, so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe as it were. So not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The gong farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The rat trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Number 10, 
mummification. Back in the ancient Egyptian times, of course, mummification was common. And even today, we're finding more mummies. It's pretty exciting. We're uncovering more ancient history every day. But how the hell was mummification done? Obviously, we can't talk about this in school because we're a little too young and maybe it's a little frightening. So, warning, it's a little gross. We've talked about teeth worms and trepidation, so I don't know. I feel like you're prepared. Well, for starters, mummification wasn't cheap. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. Now, it's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you would put a hook in your nose and then you would pull out your, um, your brains. All of the brains and the mushy stuff just right out of your head. And then you would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all of those goods, all those organs, gone, easy. And then while those are drying, you would put the lungs and the liver in jars. So ancient Egyptians, that's why they needed a lot of jars. You gotta put lungs and organs in it. And then you put the heart back in the body and then wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that good stuff. And then you would cover the body in salt for 70 days. Now around day 40, you would stuff in some sand and then come day 70, that's when you would wrap them finally in the mummy bandages. And then the sarcophagus finally awaits. Those jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber. So if you watch the mummy and they're, you know, making somebody a mummy and they're like moving around, no, it wasn't like that. That at all. It took 70 days. It was a long, exhausting process. Number nine, first open heart surgery. Okay, going back to ancient Egyptians. Why not? We're on a little track here. So they would clean the entire body out and then they would put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this, obviously. But when was the first ever open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality after this? Well, the first successful open heart surgery after mummification went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. The surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man. This is how he did it. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add, there weren't many textbooks on this type of operations at the time, so the odds of survival here were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all, being the first. At this point in time, there were no x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, and also no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through nerves, muscles, ribs, you name it, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Now, Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted, obviously, to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I didn't remember hearing those details in school. Probably would have fainted at my desk. Number eight, Bridget Bishop. Okay, getting some witchy nonsense for this one. Back in 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and in result, you would get covered in these sores, these pimple-like bubbles. It was really uncomfortable. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the people of Salem at first thought, oh, they're probably cursed. They're probably witches, hence why they're acting odd. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of the disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, talking nonsense. Obviously, they were extremely ill. And so the village doctor, William Greggs, just said, eh, I think they're bewitched. I think there's a couple of witches in our presence. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, you know, science, that's how it works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch and she was just cursing everybody around her. It was kind of the reason they kicked off the entire Salem witch hunt. It was all because of Bridget Bishop. Over the next few months, around 150 more folks were all convicted, all meeting their similar fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop or maybe it was just rye disease. It's now referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions. Feels like bugs are under your skin, it's horrible. But these doctors didn't know that back then. Everybody just thought they were all cursed, that they were witches. No, they were not cursed, they just needed help. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly stopped. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. I vote the latter, me personally. Number seven, Mail and Matt's daughter. Okay, sometimes in history, humans can be found guilty of practicing witchcraft. This is wild, this was like, Imagine, imagine that today. I've mentioned Giles Corey on this list before. He's a brave soul. But we also have to mention Malin Matt's daughter. She doesn't get the light as much as Giles does. It's one thing for a town to turn against you and call you a witch, but imagine family. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow and her own daughter told everybody that she was a witch. She was the last victim of the great Swedish witch hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully the last, one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Yeah, she didn't cry out in pain. She didn't beg for forgiveness. She said all this witchy nonsense was hogwash and she stood by it too. What an OG, she was a champ, she was a badass. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury. So 
Later, she met a similar fate. Know what I'm saying? What goes around, comes around. Like a witch flying on a broom in circles. Number six, wedding season. Okay, we'll brighten the mood up a little bit. We'll start going this way in ancient history. Maybe you fantasized about your own big day, right? Maybe it's a beach wedding. Maybe it's a themed wedding, like a winter wonderland. Maybe it's a nice ice palace. It's always fun, I guess. I'm Canadian, so I'm like, no, definitely, but I hear you. It's your big day, okay? Get creative. They say the best month to get married is June. And again, from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must. See, June was the month of the god June. No. And they protect women and life when it comes to marriage and childbirth. So if it's between that and Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, right? Better omens over here, for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then. So when majority of the population washed up at the end of May or the beginning of June, everybody smelt nice, right? Everyone felt good and they wanted to celebrate. So why not have weddings in this month as well, right after we have a little bubble bath or two. That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. It does make sense. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Yeah, maternity leave? Never heard of it, sorry. Welcome to ancient history. It's the worst. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Bree mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe. 
Good job. Good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know. I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands' or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women. However, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Number 10. Gucci to the Socks Mana Musa may be the richest human to have ever walked planet Earth. The ninth emperor of the Mali Empire made his massive fortune by exploiting his country's salt and gold production. It is estimated his wealth today would be worth $400 billion US. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of shkarol. It is however difficult to place an exact number on his wealth, as this was a very long time ago, and it is difficult to separate his wealth from the actual monarch itself. However, in his travels and hopes of securing new trade deals, he wanted to show off his good faith and wealth. When he arrived in Mecca, it was time for a shopping spree, where the wealthy king spent so much gold it actually ruined the economy. Yeah, it ruined the economy of Mecca. Honestly, that's just a big Bruce Wayne play right there. Imagine spending so much money, you single-handedly raise the inflation rate in a major city. And also a few others. He, that wasn't the only place he did it, surprisingly. He also bragged at one point that gold grows like plants where he's from. Where I'm from, it's super cold and there's lots of snow. We aren't selling snow yet, right? Number nine. Bad Vlad. Vlad the Impaler is Vlad the Impaler. Okay, sure, he wasn't the wealthiest king ever and his empire wasn't that big. But listen, I called the chief last night and he said he ain't it. Vlad was best known for his creative um, punishments to say the least. Vlad was just the kind of guy who took some folks he didn't like and, you know, impaled them with large wooden or steel stakes. Vlad he did not discriminate either. While a lot of poor people did end up with the worst suppository ever, he also ended up unaliving some wealthier folk too. This one time at band camp, Vlad had two guys come visit, and when he asked them to remove their hats, as was custom in Vlad's kingdom, they refused, which in hindsight was a really bad idea, because then Vlad had their hats nailed to their heads, so that they may never remove them again. What were poor people going to do? Try and overthrow the guy who left their family members on pikes as some really weird art installation? Truth be told, I've heard too much about this guy for me to even come close to his kingdom. I'm good over here. I don't need to be anywhere near him. You stay over there, I'll be over here. It's all good. Number eight, Return of the Mac. Okay, so you guys know Rome, right? Beautiful ancient city, monuments, aqueducts, a big scary army with red brooms on top of their heads for some reason. Mamma mia, it's beautiful. But it didn't last forever. After many years of conquest and living well, it eventually decayed and sort of split in half with the west and east. 
the East, becoming known as the Byzantine Empire, which it honestly did pretty well for itself too. This includes the adventures of Basil II. He's nicknamed the Bulgar Slayer. For video games out there, Doom Slayer is a big dude in green armor that does what exactly? Slays demons. So that means Basil slays Bulgars. Huh? Yeah, real nice dude. With his financial might and power, he was able to conquer Bulgaria, which lasted a long time actually. And by the time of his death, Basil was the wealthiest man in Byzantine. A classic tale of a man in charge exploiting and pillaging those less fortunate. Number 7. Off with his belly. King Henry VIII was a guy known for a few shady things. Removing your wife's head because you want a new wife isn't exactly the nicest way to go about divorce. I could think of some nasty other stuff too. I don't know what the f I'm saying. I think what was rather more interesting, however, was the king's diet and the quality of life divide between royalty and peasants, especially compared to the average person at the time. Sure, he was the king, but the list of foods and menus that were available to him were crazy, even by today's standards, almost rivaling the wealthy of today. His banquets would often include pork, chicken, fish, goose, beef, fruit, bread, and desserts galore. Extravagant desserts with beautiful designs. And of course you gotta have some wine to wash that all down with, which funny enough might have made them healthier to drink wine since water purification at the time wasn't so great. It is said he was consuming way more than the average person's calorie intake. Also not to mention his food was fresh or as fresh as it could be for the time. And if it wasn't, it was seasoned and preserved with very expensive spices from the far reaches of the globe. Spices that no normal person can get their hands on. The average person may not have been starving, but the quality of food and lack of fresh proteins show you what the almighty gold coin can do. Could someone please pass me the turkey? Number 6. The Cowardly Lion Richard I was the king of England for a decent amount of time, but didn't spend a lot of time of it in England. He spent most of his time raising taxes so he could fund his international warmongering. After all, that's kind of what history is about. History doesn't usually remember the times we were super friendly and got along. Which brings us to the Crusades. After recapturing Acre in 1191, his enemy Saladin was considering options of what to do next, and also considering uh, prisoner swaps which actually was common for the time. Sadly Saladin may have been taken too long, or may have been planning a re-retake of the city, because Richard had waited too long. Not sure what Saladin was up to, he took prisoners from Acre who were poor civilians and soldiers up onto a nearby hill in full view of Saladin and slaughtered 3000 people. He's remembered for being Richard the Lionheart for his bravery. All I'm saying is that it's not very brave to kill innocent poor civilians. War as hell, I guess. At number five, beavers. Remember a little while ago when I mentioned the medieval practices of Lent and how they ate dolphins because they thought they were fish? Well, we have another animal that is most definitely not a fish, but medieval people believed that it was. Beavers. Yeah, beavers. They thought that because beavers were such good swimmers that they just had to be some kind of fish and were therefore suitable to eat during Lent. Originally, it was just the tail of the beaver that was suitable for Lent because it was considered cold, but later on they figured that the whole animal was good to eat because again, they thought it was a fish. I can't really see how they looked at this furry animal and thought to themselves, ah yes, a fine sea dwelling fish. But hey, these people believed in witches, unicorns, and regularly put animals like pigs and donkeys on trial, so there you go. At number four, singing chicken. Continuing on with another insanely weird food from the medieval age, we have one that was pretty dangerous to eat, though the people who lived back then probably didn't know it was so unsafe. Back then, some chefs would prepare a pretty theatrical dish and called it singing chicken. Man, the things that they did to these poor chickens. Anyways, singing chicken was prepared by taking the chicken's neck and tying it with quicksilver and sulfur, and when the bird was heated, it made a sound like it was singing. Why this was necessary? Who the heck knows? There were other versions of these kinds of theatrical meals as well, where swans, pigs, and even fish were made to look like it was breathing fire. Chefs would soak cotton in alcohol and place it inside the animal, and when it was time to serve, they would light the cotton on fire and make the food look like it was some kind of dragon. At number three, roasted swan. A lot of people see swans as beautiful creatures. I mean, I see them as deceptive geese because even though they are pretty, they will still attack you and eat your young, but I digress. Though swans are a lot of people's favorite animals, in medieval times, swans were more so people's favorite food. Yeah, even the swans weren't safe from being devoured. Now, some of you might think, oh, well, since it's a bird, it's probably prepared in a normal way. And to those people, I say, have you been paying attention at all? Nothing was normal back then, and of course they had to make things weird. There were two ways of preparing a swan. The weird way, 
and the strange way. The first way of preparing the swan was to mince the entrails of a boiled swan with bread, ginger, and blood, and then mix it with vinegar. Yum. And the second way was to cut the bird open, remove its skin, roast it on a spit, and then reclothe it with its skin and feathers and present it to eager guests. Sounds absolutely horrible. On number two, lamprey. Imagine this, a gross, slithery eel with gray scaly skin and a suction cup-like face full of tiny sharp teeth. Does that sound tasty to you? Because I can't say it does. However, to people in the medieval age, apparently it was finger licking good because this lamprey was all the rage and was actually a favorite of King Henry I of England who was actually said to have died from eating too many lamprey. Lamprey was considered a delicacy and was often enjoyed with a side of hot sauce. I don't care how it's prepared, you cannot catch me eating a sharp tooth worm of the sea. And finally at number one, live food. I think that by now we understand that medieval cuisine was as much about theatrics as it was about sustenance. Between singing chickens, fire breathing fish, and cock and trices, a lot was happening in the kitchens back then, but by far the weirdest food trend from the medieval age was their live food shows. Because a lot of people loved a good show, chefs came up with a new idea to wow their dinner guests where they would serve an animal that looked to be dead and cooked, only for it to get up and run away when it got to the table. The most common animal used for these theatrics was of course the chicken. To prepare this unorthodox dish, the chef would take the animal, let's use the chicken as an example, and they would pluck it while it was still alive and glaze it to make it look like it had been cooked. They would then wait until the chicken fell asleep in the kitchen and bring it out on a platter. However, just as the chicken was about to be carved up and served, it would wake up and run down the table creating a chaotic dinner. Another common live food that would be served was frog pie. Chefs would put frogs in a pie and then when the top of the pie was cut open, the frogs would jump out and startle the dinner guests. Now how's that for dinner and a show? Kicking off the list at number 10, the golden toad. Scientists usually use frogs as a diagnostic for how things are going to go on our planet. And the answer is not good, usually it's not good. Especially not for the froggy woggies. Amphibians breathe through their skin, which I gotta say one, gross, but it makes them extra sensitive to changes in their environment. The golden toad extinction event happened pretty recently and very quickly. In their native home of Costa Rica, it was considered a good omen, or lucky if you saw it, but then sightings of this shiny dude became less and less and then poof. 1987, these tiny little guys started to disappear one by one like the dreams we had as kids, almost, some would say. The local population was ill at ease and they had good reason to be. Alongside the golden toad, nearly half of all frogs and toads also started dying within a 30 kilometer range. And even stranger is that the area was free from human intervention, which led scientists to conclude that the cause was related to, you guessed it, climate change. As the temperatures rose, the frogs became more susceptible to the chytrid fungus, which decimated frog populations worldwide. And in 1989, the golden toad was the first species to become extinct as a direct result of climate change. Sad stuff. Rachel recommends reading The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Kohlberg because, well, it's a good one, so check it out yourselves. Number nine, the Pina Island Tortoise. When the Mayans said the world was going to end in 2012, they may have just been onto something. We lost the last Pina Giant Tortoise back in 2012 and his name was Lonesome George. His name was Lonesome George. I'm gonna be the first to cry on this. And for decades before his passing, scientists were trying to get him to mate with females of a similar subspecies but he just wasn't feeling it. To be fair, look at him. The guy looks exhausted. He looks like he needs three coffees before swiping right on mating apps. <laughs> oh, Lonesome George and his wrinkly necked friends. <laughs> this is sad, Taylor. Lonesome George and his wrinkly necked friends weighed in at about 400 pounds growing up to six feet long. Again, this extinction comes back to us humans with the use of tortoises as an onboard food in the 19th century and the goat population of Pinta Island growing rapidly during the 60s and 70s. These tortoises ran out of food. Number eight, the Labrador duck. Love ducks. You might as well play Goose Goose Duck because sadly, the Labrador duck is no more. But even before it went extinct, the Labrador duck was always rare and it served that way. Also referred to as the pie duck or the skunk duck due to its coloring, not its smell, not much is known about its behavior and habitat, but we do know that it liked to hang out in sheltered bays, sandbars, harbors in New Jersey, Long Island, New England, and of course, coastal Labrador, Northern Quebec. Did it have a New York accent? <laughs> Did it have a New York accent or a Canadian one? 
we just can't be sure. We've been looking, but honestly, we don't know at this point. The Labrador duck went extinct in the 1870s, but the direct cause is still unknown. Was it eaten to death? We don't know. The bird was known to taste bad, but it was pretty cheap for meat at the market, so that could be one possibility. But the ducks were actually hunted for their feathers more than their meat and their eggs were harvested as well. Another reason is that they were often in competition with us over their main food source, which were, as you would have guessed, mollusks. Human interaction obviously played a massive role in its ducktails, especially considering the last known specimen was shot in New York. Shot in New York. Not a movie, assassinated in New York. Did they realize what was happening around the time? Probably, yeah, realistically probably. But it just goes to show how much the level of care has differed over the last century in relation to extinction. Number seven, the great auk. Its name makes you think this thing is the size of a moose or it's some type of ox, when in fact it's really just a cute flightless seabird was, rather. Once belonging in colonies off North Atlantic coast, the great auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its tiny wings would only be used to swim. Water wings. They were much smaller than 13 centimeters long. Little penguin flappy arm, no wonder they couldn't fly. They were cute, but quite defenseless. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting, and it just happened to be where most of these great auks were hanging out. Newfoundland looked like the iceberg in Club Penguin, so quite a few of them bit the bullet. By the 1950s, the last two known specimens were hunted by a fisherman on LD Island, just off the coast of Iceland. So if you need to pay your respects, that's where you need to head. Number six, the stellar sea cow. Just like bumblebees are the whales of the insect world, they were the cows of the sea. <clears throat> okay, I know, I think I know about these cows. Hailing from the same order as the manatee, the stellar sea cow was a stellar sea animal until the very end, but they may return one day. Fingers crossed, more on that in a second. The stellar sea cow was named after George Wilhelm Steller, who discovered this massive blubbery creature in 1741 during the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition after the crew became shipwrecked. Adults would have weighed about 9,000 kilograms and could reach lengths past 11 meters. That's a whole lot of cow. Despite surviving since the Pleistocene epoch over 2.6 million 11,000 years ago, there were no match for humans. They only swam at a meter deep and communicated via huffs and sighs to their family and lifelong partners, as I do normally. Are you hungry? <sighs> kind of. George Steller commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which made it incredibly easy to hunt them. Okay, that's really depressing. Leave it to humans to exploit love in order to kill. Classic Bruce Willis stuff. Considering the one year gestation period, the species just couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with the hunting, so they just died. But they may return. Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which can mean we could see these creatures again one day. Number five, tanks. Okay, so after a few Olympics, people got tired of walking those many, many miles just to see some dudes run a mile. We need more events, said the Olympic organizers, but what? We have athletes running, what else is there? Okay, okay, I hear you. What if we get athletes to run, but with full military armor and gear on? Yeah, that's right. There was another race where athletes would wield the armor of the Greek soldiers and race. I can imagine that there was a clunking noise, or at least a lot of it, and also how difficult it must be to run in bronze armor. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. Come a little closer. A little closer, a little closer. Whoa, too close. Bronze armor isn't good for chafing. Cause let me tell you something, hot Mediterranean sun, not a lot of water and running in hot metal attire? Someone's gonna have to come over and put baby powder on my bum bum. Number four, the classic. I don't know why, but when I think of ancient Greeks, I think of grapes on the vine, marble, chariots, and, and the movie 300. It's, it's kind of hard to forget those spray on abs. Although someone could put them on me, kind of nice. Equestrian events were another event of the ancient Greek Olympics, and I have something nice to say about something for once. While every other event was dominated by males, because, well, only males were allowed to compete, of course, the equestrian events allowed women. Nice! And naturally, ladies, when someone points the spotlight on you, you shine. A notable winner of the event was Sinisica, a Spartan princess and athlete who was an excellent horse breeder. I guess that's a nice thing to be remembered by. According to some records, two monuments were built in honor of her victory. I rode a horse once. I can firmly say that I prefer the automobile. Just saying. You walk around like that, that's why all the cowboys walk like this. You just do that all that. Number three, the long jump. After running and running in armor, it was discovered that jumping makes for a great Olympic event. 
How high? How far? It's simple, really. It should come as no surprise that I did not perform well in that section of track and field day at school. To my disadvantage, there was no strength-based events because it was considered unhealthy for us because we were so young. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. My counter to that argument would be, why are you making tubby kids run the 1500 meter? That's liable to have the kid with asthma writing his math test in the hospital bed later. I'd probably be joining him. However, I am a supporter of the Ancient Greek jumping event. Basically, athletes gotta jump as far as they can whilst holding two large rocks. Now, if we did that today, people would know what it's like to do a long jump when grandma feeds you too much. Yeah, it's not easy. Number two, the discus, the javelin, and the hammer. Sounds like a good band. Hey, these are all events that we still compete in today. That's awesome. But doesn't it make you nervous when the athletes are throwing those bad boys around? Especially the hammer throw. God, it just makes me so nervous. While I couldn't find an exact example of an accident happening, I doubt the ancient Greeks had safety in mind for spectators. The discus was made from stone or bronze, and they were tossing those suckers the same way Guy Fieri tosses Caesar salad. Which is a lot, because he's kind of a big guy too. However, for me, it's the javelin that's most terrifying, as that was an appropriate weapon of war for the time. And athletes are just throwing them around like it's nothing. You're telling me the crowd was a safe distance away from the splash zone? Yeah, just keep your eye on the sky to be safe, folks. I don't know about that. Number one, rap battle. Honestly, this is something we should bring back to the Olympics. While I was complaining about not being able to compete in strength-based events earlier, I, as a theater kid, would have much preferred some of the other less intensive events the ancient Greeks had up to offer. The ancient Greeks were not just chucking stones and chafing in bronze armor. There was also a competition with the arts, poetry, song, and singing. Imagine if America entered Eminem into a rap battle contest. There would be no contest. Imagine if Canada entered one for musicians. KD Lang, Celine Dion, oh, and Anne Murray. Just singing angels. Kick it off the list at number 10, Black Cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly. You know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you, what's the first thing you think? Bad luck, bad omens, bad stuff? Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory IX, he exposed a cult of witches in Northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep. He knew some of the ritual words used at these cult meetings. He knew everything, which in my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now at first, when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine, Flat Earth. Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the Earth isn't flat, that's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the Dark Ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet, or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat Earthers. Shocking enough, the Middle Ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the Earth as a sphere, with four cardinal points as well, even going back further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link, and then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to. I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman laundry days, urine makes leather soft, 
We get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help. They were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. Sorry, Big Chud. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just fine, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, Good game. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this, here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare, and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta, you know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards, you know what I mean? It's like a ritual, you gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor Place riot in New York City back in 1849, that was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. But how many of those were actual witches? Like, really? Was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know... Was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus. So she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good, the middle age greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 15th 61, which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. Number five, best man origins. I got asked to be a best man recently. So you know what? I have to share some, some, some love. I have to share some ancient best man love. It was a little different back then, that's for sure. Back in those days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom. That's normal, whether that's a brother or a best friend. Back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different. And it was all about protecting one's assets rather than, you know, anything to do with love. Back then, Bride kidnapping was so common that if there was somebody else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to send someone else, they might try and steal her for themselves, right? It's awful. That's where the best man comes in. He's gotta watch for dudes hopping fences ready to steal your wife and run away. The best man's job was to protect the bride at all costs. And if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. That's wild. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure she didn't try and make a run for it as well. It sounds okay at first and then you're like, oh no, it's all horrible. History course. Number four, ancient divorce. Eh, it happens sometimes. Weird. Almost like those marriages I just uh, explained wouldn't work out all the time. Weird. Trial by combat. You've probably heard of this, right? We've all seen that Game of Thrones episode. The eyes and the... Huh. 
Yeah, that's a good one. That was the norm, right? You fight for your freedom. But what about divorce by combat? You ever heard of this? If you and your significant other weren't getting along back in the dark ages, instead of dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork, instead, you would battle each other in front of a crowd because why not? It's the medieval times. It was an organized event that included restrictions for the husband. Now, it's pretty hilarious to think back on, but the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back, while the wife, soon to be happy ex-wife, ran around in circles around said hole, also carrying a sack full of rocks, hitting the ex-husband with the rocks the whole time. Yeah, Pretty intense and also pretty hilarious to think of. Yeah, that's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot. Get out of here. A sack of rocks? Just take the castle, take the horse. I don't care, I'm out. I'll sign anything. I'll stamp anything. Number three, the battle of the stray dog. Okay, now we're gonna go back into some weird battles that we probably missed in school. I grew up with dogs my whole life, okay? It's stressful at times. You open the door for a second and all of a sudden your furry friends are running down the street after a blue jay and your heart's racing. Since the second Balkan war in the early 1900s, Greece and Bulgaria were going head to head, right? At this point, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of emotions, tensions were of course high. But come October 1925, things finally escalated even more. A Greek soldier was chasing after his dog, who just decided to bolt randomly. But in doing so, he accidentally crossed the border into Bulgaria. So he was shot at, right? It was scary. The Greeks at that point were beyond upset, so they marched into Bulgaria and soon began a full-on war. All because of this dog who saw a blue jay probably. By the time the international committee negotiated a ceasefire to clear up the obvious misunderstanding, 50 people had already lost their lives. So yeah, keep those leashes on, please, unless you're in a off-leash dog park. Cause you might start a war, you never know. Number two, the Battle of Los Angeles. Of course I have to mention this battle. This one's a little bit different, but you know, maybe some UFO stuff going on here. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great LA Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February, 1942. This event, first of all, it took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So yeah, everybody was of course immensely stressed out at this point. And then something like 25 enemy aircraft was then spotted flying over LA. In the late hours of February 24th. So now everyone's freaking out. Air raids went off, blackouts were in effect. This was not a drill, right? Right? Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells. In total, around 1,400 shells were all fired off. Two people had heart attacks. Five people died in total from this retaliation. And it was all a false alarm. Yep. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Yeah. Huh, oops. Thought I heard a noise, my bad, we'll just close that. No one touches anymore, I guess. War nerves. And finally, number one, Battle of Zappolino. This one is pretty epic, okay. All over a bucket. Turning the calendars back to 1325, the Battle of Zappolino, it was a large scale event all over a tiny bucket. And no, I'm not joking. The War of the Oaken Bucket. Now this war consisted of two Italian towns, Bologna and Medina. Now it all kicked off when soldiers from Medina snuck into Bologna with intentions to steal. To steal the wooden bucket from the city's well. Right? Resources were sparse back then, of course, so the Bolognese declared war, and then they sent in an invading force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavaliers. The city of Modena had a smaller army. They had 500 infantrymen and only 2,000 cavalry forces. But the thing is, those guys still won. They chased the larger army back to Bologna while destroying towns in the process. Now, some recall them bringing the bucket back just to taunt the city, but right now the bucket is currently on display still in Modena. So it ended up finding its forever home there. And you can go check it out if you want. That many people kicked the bucket over this bucket. History is strange, my friend. On number 10, roast hedgehog. Hedgehogs, am I right? They're cute little spiky balls of fun and they make pretty good pets too. They're so cute that you would never want anything bad to happen to them, right? Well, if you lived in the medieval ages, you might beg to differ because while today we see hedgehogs as these lovable little creatures, back then they were nothing but something to feed your family for dinner. Sorry to anyone who owns a hedgehog. Yeah, hedgehogs were a delicacy back then and there's even a record of a common recipe for them. In the olden days when someone was looking to cook up a hedgehog for dinner, Dinner, you would first have to unalive it and then gut it, tie it up, and wrap it in pastry. Apparently, if your hedgehog wouldn't unroll after it was uh, taken out, so to speak, you would just have to simply boil it in water and continue the preparation process. Apparently, back then, it was believed that eating hedgehogs helped with medical conditions like throat inflammation and leprosy. Not really sure how effective that was, but it was still a thing. At number nine, porpoise pottage. During Lent, people weren't allowed to eat meat. Normally, people would substitute 
substitute fish into their diet during this time, but if you were one of the wealthy, then you could treat yourself to something a little more extravagant than just plain old fish. For those who could afford it, they would sit down to a seafood feast, and they really ate anything that came out of the sea. We're talking fish, lobster, crabs, eels, and dolphins. Yeah, they thought that dolphins were fish and so safe to eat during Lent. In a recipe book from 1399 written by King Richard II's cooks, there was a recipe for porpoise fermentry, which was basically a sweet and spicy wheat porridge with dolphin on top. It consisted of almond milk and saffron and just sounds absolutely vile. I couldn't imagine what a dolphin would even taste like, but I wouldn't imagine that it would taste very good, especially with almond milk, wheat, and saffron. But would you guys try it? Now before I carry on telling you guys about the weird things that people ate in medieval times, I would first like to take a moment to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, garbage. Ever heard of a garbage plate? It's a dish that originated in Rochester, New York, and it is a big plate of things like macaroni salad, baked beans, french fries, and a bunch of other things. Well, in medieval times, they also sort of had their own garbage plate, but unfortunately, it doesn't sound nearly as good as the one from Rochester. Their garbage was pretty foul, and honestly, I don't think that you could pay me enough to sit down and eat this thing. As the name dictates, garbage was made of, well, garbage. Anything that wasn't used in other dishes was basically thrown into a pot, cooked up with some seasonings, hopes, and dreams. Even the recipe sounds gross, dude. In an excerpt from a medieval cookbook, to prepare garbage, it says to quote, take good giblets, aka the garbage, chicken heads, feet, livers, gizzards, and wash them all clean. Throw them into a nice pot and add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, and sage chopped small. Then take bread, steep it in the same broth, draw it through a strainer, add and let it boil till done. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which was sour grape or apple juice, salt, and a little saffron, and serve it forth." End quote. Yeah, I think I'm gonna pass on that one, thank you. At number 7, cock and trice. When living in medieval times, people had to be very creative when it came to cooking. You had to create flavors with limited resources while also trying to dodge the risk of poisoning people if you're not careful, but this next dish pushed the boundaries of culinary art so much that Gordon Ramsay would have to call every chef who made this an idiot sandwich. Back in medieval times, some chefs would prepare a dish called cock and trice, and it was kind of a monstrosity. This imaginative dish was made by combining a pig and a chicken into some kind of revolutionary Frankenstein's monster. Essentially, this dish was made by cooking a pig and a chicken, and then the chef would cut both animals in half, and then attach the front half of a pig to the rear half of a chicken. Then it would be stuffed and roasted on a spit, glazed in egg yolks and saffron, and topped with a gold leaf before being served to an elite like a king or queen. There was also an alternative version of this dish where instead of having the two halves of the animal mashed together, it would instead have the chicken riding the pig, and some chefs would even adorn the chicken with a knight's helmet for some extra pizzazz. Not sure why this was invented, but it certainly is creative to say the least. At number 6, Roasted Cat we started off this list talking about one common household pet that was traditionally eaten in medieval times, but now we have another, so for anyone who has a feline friend, you might want to skip this part. Roasted cat was yet another bizarre food that was eaten back in the olden days, and I can't really say I'm all that surprised. I mean, they were eating hedgehogs, dolphins, and garbage, so I wouldn't put it past them to take a bite out of Garfield too. Roasted cat was a pretty straightforward dish. They would just marinate it and roast it like they would any other kind of animal, but what makes this dish strange other than the fact that it's a cat was the way that it was prepared and the superstition behind it. Cats already have a lot of superstition behind them so it makes sense that in medieval times they believed all sorts of things about felines but when it came to cooking them it was believed that cutting the head off before cooking it was a vital step because quote it is not for eating for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment. End quote. So yeah, don't go eating cat brains, I guess. Number five, steal. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody, it was also pretty tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras, it was literally like Assassin's Creed. You would just throw your hood up, grab an apple, hide it, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and be like, yes, I got away safely. The markup for stealing was also pretty insane for the time, but it made sense. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times whatever you stole. 
so you'd better be a track star. If you're still on that pie, you're like, I gotta go. This is, my family needs this. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft, so you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Not trying to promote stealing here, but I'm talking about a time where people would risk their life to steal a loaf of bread for their family, you know? Not just like pickpocket a blackberry. But again, sometimes depending on where you got caught, you would lose an ear or you would lose a hand for stealing a cranberry. Anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. So run fast. Number four, blasphemy. When the Catholic Church was running the show during the Middle Ages, you better have been part of the God Squad or else you're gonna join them, apparently. Thomas Aquinas wrote about blasphemy in the Middle Ages saying that if we compare murder and blasphemy as regards to the object of those sins, it is clear that blasphemy, which is a sin committed directly against God, is more grave than murder, which is a sin against one's neighbor. On the other hand, if we compare them in respect of the harm wrought by them, murder is the graver sin, for murder does more harm to one's neighbor than blasphemy does to God. Yeah, that's, the, that's what you gotta deal with if you went back in time. Good, good luck, hope you're religious. If you spoke ill of the church and had beliefs of your own, God forbid, pun intended, that was one of the most wicked crimes to date. If you were charged with blasphemy, your tongue was removed with hot tongs or pliers. Awful. According to the Old Testament, other punishments would include stoning or hanging. All because you just, you said, I don't like him. I don't like that guy that does things. The way he's doing this, I'm hungry and I'm in pain and my family's dead. I don't know. Sorry. Blasphemy was common because you could accidentally do it, unlike stealing, you know? On my way to the studio today, I slipped on some ice, and let me tell you, if I was in the Middle Ages, I would have been charged twice before 9 a.m. Number three, live in the city. Okay, you may grow up wanting to live in the big city, eh? The Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. Whatever, whatever pulls you to the city, it would have been a lot different back then. Living in the city sucked. It was actually preferred to live in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Like starving was better than this, really. If you were poor in the city, you had a short and nasty life. Cities were often built near rivers, but it didn't take long for said rivers to be full of sewage. Stinky water. I mentioned the plague earlier. Just like today, numbers pop in large cities, so if disease hit the town, it hit the town pretty hard just constantly wiping out these packed crowds over and over. And maybe you're a fan of the nightlife. Maybe you wish you were able to hit up these local medieval taverns, have a ye olde IPA, ale, whatever the hell. It wasn't even that fun. Curfews were strict, and if you were caught outside of that curfew, the odds of your drunk self getting robbed would be pretty high. Also, cities had public bathhouses too, which sounds nice, but again, during the Black Death, maybe let's not take a dip today. Let's, let's just wait. wait, let's just wait a week. Number two, wear stripes. On Wednesdays, we wear pink, but we never wear stripes. Medieval Europe, if you were caught wearing stripes, maybe you're trying to make a fashion statement, you could literally end up dead. There isn't a gang of mimes that will silently take you out if you wear their colors. No, stripes in medieval Europe was seen as the devil's clothing. There are accounts of real people getting arrested for wearing stripes. That's it. Where and when this began, it's hard to pinpoint, but in 1310, in the French town of Rouen, a cobbler was sentenced to death because he decided to wear stripes that day. It was a big deal though. It wasn't a law that changed depending on what town you're in. It was bigger than that. In 1295, Pope Bonifaci VIII banned religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. So it wasn't like, oh, this town's cool. We can wear stripes here. It's like, no, you're the devil. Bye. And finally, number one. Witchcraft. Whenever we think back to the Middle Ages, it's hard to forget that we once would accuse others of being a witch. It's like five plus five, I think that's 10. We're like, how did you know that? You're a witch, you're definitely a witch. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and mm, wizardry. No better sous chef than a golden retriever. Just mix it up some potions. To be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so I don't completely disagree on that thought. But cats? What's a cat doing? with a cauldron. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused as well as two dogs. If their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Nothing to do with the poison rye, just all over the floor. It's for sure part-time witch. Villagers believed that witches traveled at night, not by broom, but by riding on the back of your furry friend. And it also wasn't just dogs or cats. They thought witches rode pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. I'd be like, I'm good, I'll beat you there. Even so, if you were convicted of being a witch, you had to confess. If you confessed to being a witch, your life was spared, and, and oddly enough, if you refused to confess, then you were executed. In the meantime though, being a witch and all, your head was being dunked in water, you were sleep deprived, these horrible torture methods were used until you were so broken that eventually you just admit to being a witch. You're like, fine, I, me and Airbud, we witch it up, happy, and then you're fine. If you were suspected of witchcraft, you also had to get naked in front of all these creeps while they looked for the devil's mark. The devil's mark being a birthmark or a mole or freckle, blemish on the skin, whatever. All signs of making deals with the devil, apparently. 
this thing would have, I would have gone to jail for sure for this one. I would have been dead for this, that's huge. Number 10, hotel speed. Okay, picture this. You're young and in a hotel with your parents. Maybe it's a vacation, maybe it's a trip, or maybe it's a hockey game, nice. Nonetheless, you find yourself in a long hallway with a strange looking carpet. Hotel hallways always have weird carpets, I don't know. Maybe it's the giant hamburger and milkshake you just ate. Maybe it's the hotel TV or the excitement of just not being at home. But something has changed. You're different. Your powers have been amplified. For this corridor will be your personal racetrack. A shame Guinness World Records isn't here to clock you in at max speed because for some reason if you fly down that hallway any faster, the rug would catch fire. Yes, the joys of running down a hotel hallway. This is probably how the first Olympians felt at the first Olympic Games. I'm comparing it to that for some reason, sure we'll go with it. Where the only event at these Olympic Games was running. Like many of the other events that would later come later on, this was done without clothing, which is fine. As long as you're, you know, not doing that in the hotel hallway. Keep clothes on. Number nine, WWE, brother. Only if you could have seen the look on my face when I discovered that wrestling in the WWE isn't as real as I thought it was. The shock, the confusion, and the loud ringing in my ear. I really, it was pretty serious for me. I got really into it as a kid. It gave me some Vietnam flashbacks, seriously. You mean to tell me that there was an intricate planning into every hit and fall, every entrance, and every time we heard the sound of a steel chair connecting with someone's forehead? Oh man. As a kid, I never would have guessed that, but when The Undertaker walks in a room, you take notice. Those thoughts just go away. Sadly, the ancient Greeks did not have cage matches, turnbuckles, or personas based on hyper male confidence. What they did have, however, was some real wrestling, some bare knuckle, no clothes, oiled up kind of wrestling. Nice. Instead of a one leg up pin, a scoring system was used for when the opponent's body was on the ground. And I'm sure lots of people got injured in the process. Whew, no thanks, I'll stick to the cage matches. Number eight, pank ration. Here's another story for you. It might seem kind of silly, but growing up, I got to witness the birth of a mainstream sport. The UFC got its start in the early 90s, but blew up in the mid 2000s. Now, I'm not much of a sports guy. Besides major championship matches or games, I don't really watch any sports. I'm more of a film and video game guy, if you couldn't tell. However, my first interaction with the UFC was seeing an octagon shaped ring, and my grade two geometry immediately kicked in and said, that's an octagon, wow, okay, that's different. However, the second thing that I noticed is that this was not wrestling, and this wasn't boxing. It was kind of a mixture of both. Sort of a mixed martial art, if you will. Well, that's kind of what pank ration was. There was no indirect punching or kicking, but pretty much anything else goes. To me, this sounds like a good way to get injured. Kind of like wrestling before, now it's just even worse. And as I'm sure you all know, paper cuts can be lethal back then, so maybe not such a good idea. Did I mention this is done without clothes too? There's, everyone's, everyone's naked. Number seven, the road trip. This isn't an Olympic event, but honestly, it should have been. Think about it for a minute. I want you guys to look out the nearest window right now. Get up, go ahead, look out the nearest window. Tell me what you see. You probably see a road with cars. When you need a fast food fix, it's as simple as getting in a car and driving on the road to your destination or getting it delivered with your favorite food delivery app. It's 2022, we can do a lot of crazy stuff now. What I'm getting at is that people from all over the Greek city states came to Olympia to witness the first Olympics. Except, you know, it would have been a triathlon just to get there. Frankly, my biggest fear, walking. That was the main mode of transportation, which after a while in those sandals was probably hell. Imagine trekking many, many miles by land and sea to only be exhausted to watch athletes Become exhausted. Oh, I need some water just thinking about it. Woo. Number six, peace. Peace. What's better than a good war? A better armistice, or at least I'd like to hope so. During these first Olympic games, which on a side note, if I had a time machine and a scooter, I'd love to see firsthand. There was people and athletes coming from all corners of Hellenistic civilization, all Greek states and colonies. Well, sometimes these Greek states got caught up in these little things called wars. Who knew, right? But when the Olympics were on, a truce was called. Messengers were dispatched to announce the truce, which gave all the people traveling on their long treks safe passage. I also find it somewhat amusing that they did this all for one day. That's right, the events only lasted one day. Some folks did days of traveling only to have it all be over in 24 hours. The opening ceremony couldn't have taken that long either, so 
feel like it's just kind of a waste of time. Only if we got some of that peace right now. Russia is looking at Ukraine a certain kind of way, just, just waiting to act up. Bad Russia. Stay in your corner. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified, and once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise, hard to get out of your mind. Radiocarbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that Shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia. Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I like got our producer Chris. I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that. Cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly, it was far too cold for them to even stand a chance, and it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were, Horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, Plague Bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now, bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away, and then they would bury them, right? Just way over there. Great idea, honestly, the further the better. Couldn't agree more. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. Now, it sounds sad, but this was the best call, all things considered. So no, you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon. And finally, number one, medieval punishment cleaner. This one really sucks. Best for last, here we go. Back in medieval times, many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and then head home. They're like, hey, classic Sunday. This was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johan, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray bottle. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot. Like a lot, a lot. Yeah.